Welcome to the 2022 National Crime Victims Service Award Ceremony. Please rise if you are able for the presentation of colors by the Joint Armed Forces Color Guard, followed by the national anthem performed by the President's own United States Marine Brass Quintet. Everyone, please be seated as we invite the National Park Service Deputy Director, Sean Benj, who wishes to welcome you to the National Mall. Good afternoon and thank you to Attorney General Garland, honorable members of Congress, and all that have joined to be here today. On behalf of Director Chuck Sams and the National Park Service, I'm honored to welcome you to Constitution Gardens for the National Crime Victim Service Awards. It's fitting that we gather in this place which serves as a living legacy to the creation of our republic and a tribute to our founding documents and ideals, ideals that we as public servants take an oath to uphold. Today, honorees represent that service and sacrifice by providing crucial support and services to victims of crimes. The National Park Service is proud of its mission to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of our treasured places, just like the National Mall, for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of future generations. With over 400 parks and 300 million visitors each year, law enforcement is a key part of our mission. This includes 1,900 uniformed rangers and U.S. Park Police officers along with 40 criminal investigators who diligently and professionally serve our parks and our visitors. As you can all appreciate, this is a huge task and we have benefited directly from your help. The Office of Victims of Crime have provided us with critical funding for many years in direct support of our victim assistance program. Thank you for this support. We've developed policy, we've established best practices, we provided annual training for rangers and agents, helped local teams plan for victim services, and worked to identify resources and solutions all across the United States. Most recently, we were able to hire dedicated victim specialists at some of our largest parks. In just a little over a year, these specialists have already had a measurable positive impact, supporting victims in more than 150 cases across 33 different parks. 
These critical support has helped us meet our obligations under the Victims' Rights and Restitution Act, which ultimately results in more successful prosecutions. We are working together to ensure victims have a voice through victim-centered and trauma-informed practices, all with the goal of dignity and resilience throughout the criminal justice process. We could not be more pleased with the success of this partnership between the Office for Victims of Crime and the National Park Service, and we look forward to it continuing for many years to come. Thank you again for being here, and my sincere congrats to all the honorees. It gives us great pleasure to present the 2022 National Crime Victims' Rights Week theme video underscoring this year's theme, Rights, Access, Equity for All Victims. It's very painful to lose someone you love. Yeah, that was my baby. I was beating on the floor and asking God to take this pain from me. I needed help. So I went to classes and found out how to be an advocate. Rights are important. Everybody have rights and a lot of people don't know they have rights. We work with survivors who experience any kind of violence. So that might be domestic violence, sexual assault, family violence, bullying, any of those things. I want to be sure I understand everything that happened. And so it's very important for us to make sure that we have folks in this field who know what the community needs. A long time ago, we never went anywhere by ourselves. We always had someone accompanying us. Nowadays, with what's going on in the trafficking of our young people, no one's walking beside them. So they're walking alone. They have nobody to witness, no one to call for help. The isolation is devastating. Every day is something going on. Every day, homicides. They want justice for their loved one. They want help for the pain. When we don't address the causes of violence, when we don't address uh, the trauma that people experience, that's how the cycle of violence continues. So like, if I am a survivor of a gun violence, um, it's very important to have the voices of crime victims at the center of policy making. Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, we are a national network of about 90,000 uh, victims of crime uh, across the country. Thousands of survivors getting together to be able to speak and make a change about the policies that actually affect us. What it's about is building the next uh, generation of leaders. Go ahead. It has given me the ability to fight for justice. People with disabilities are constantly fighting for rights, whether it's in transportation or education or community integration. And victim services in the criminal justice is just another area. Kathy had suggested I talk to you about some of the work that we can partner on. There's a huge amount of adaptation and accommodations that need to exist for it to even come close to having some sort of equity effect. After I turned back around, I got hit in the head. The Adult Advocacy Center works hard to make sure that there is representation by people with disabilities in forms of leadership. Because oftentimes what we notice is that there are agencies who will say they're doing the work of working with folks who have disabilities, but they are not actually being led by folks with disabilities. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started and I'll share my screen. We all have so many different skill sets. We definitely can come together to try new and innovative approaches and to support each other um, because there's so much work that needs to be done. In our Native communities, it's the voice of the people that makes the change. 
all these different ways that people are exploited and taken advantage of um, end up sort of in this cauldron of what we now call MMIR or murdered and missing indigenous relatives. And uh, we miss them. She had went somewhere with somebody and next thing you know, she's gone. Are they still investigating? They opened the case and they're just like, oh, it's just another missing person. Nicholas. We want to stop trafficking. It's not just this individual. It hurts the whole community. And the whole community needs to step forward and say, that's enough. What does justice mean for a child or a baby who's been raped and then is groomed to be able to survive sexual torture so that people can make money off of that? Because that's me and my voice is the sound of justice. We have to be able to heal that spirit because you got to heal that spirit before anything can change. It's crucial to have native-led solutions that are rooted in the culture because it's through the culture that we're going to find healing. There should be a lot of red in this quilt. The quilt is very exciting. We can express ourselves as individuals and as a community to raise awareness around MMIR here in northern Minnesota. We're creating beauty out of tragedy, and that, that is justice. <laughs> it's important to make sure that our work is survivor-centered and that we listen to what they need. All crime victims have a right to services. All crime victims have a right to heal. never get tired of watching that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christina Rose. I'm the director of the Office for Victims of Crime. Welcome to our 2022 National Crime Victims Service Awards Ceremony. And what a beautiful place to hold our event today. Thank you, Deputy Director Venge, for welcoming us. We're so grateful to the National Park Service for this place. Welcome to members of Congress, U.S. attorneys, my colleagues at OJP, OVC, and across the Department of Justice, and all of our distinguished guests who are here today. We're honored to be joined here by the leadership at the Department of Justice, Attorney General Merrick Garland, Deputy Attorney... <laughs> Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco, <laughs> Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta, <laughs> and Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Amy Solomon. <laughs> we are so grateful for your leadership for your support of our work at OVC and for the deep passion and commitment that you've demonstrated for serving victims of crime. This is the first time that all three of our top DOJ leadership have come to our ceremony. And believe me, it speaks volumes. I'm thrilled, uh, yay. <laughs> I'm thrilled to welcome this year's 2022 National Crime Victim Service Award recipients, the reason we are all here today. This is a remarkable group of individuals. And after you watch the tribute videos for each one of them, I know you will agree. And speaking of videos, I want to extend a very special thank you to the indomitable Robin Smith and her team at Video Action for their exquisite work on the videos. Video Action has been our partner for many years now, and we are so incredibly grateful for that. 
I also want to thank our partners at the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Every year, they help us to raise awareness about victims' rights and services by making sure our Crime Victims' Rights Week posters and flyers get out to post offices all across the country. So I have a quick story. I recently took a road trip through the South a few weeks ago, and I kept asking my partner to stop at every post office that we saw so I could jump out and see our posters and flyers. It was amazing. And I said to one postal worker, oh my gosh, you have our posters up. I'm the director of the office that, that made those posters. And that person was not impressed at all. <laughs> not at all. I got nothing. And my poor staff, of course, I sent them post office pictures throughout my trip. But enough about me. Today would not be complete if I didn't take a moment to recognize the amazing OVC staff. They are driven, they are passionate, and they are 100% committed to the mission of OVC. Every day, mm -hmm. every day they inspire me and they motivate me to be a better director. So right now I'd like to ask the OVC staff to stand up, raise your hand, whatever you're comfortable with, and be recognized, please. And I know there are many watching from home as we're streaming this on Facebook today. So last night at our candlelight vigil, we were able to lift up the voices of survivors through spoken word, through film, and through music. I want to give a very special thank you to the American Pops Orchestra, founded by maestro Luke Frazier and led last night by Zachary Peasley. We had the pleasure of listening to the magical vocals of Corey Parker and Bela Witten, and I still get goosebumps when I think about it. It was also a great privilege to hear from our guest speaker last night, Oswald Thomas, who told us in very stark and honest words that our crime victim compensation and assistance programs are still not reaching the people who need them most, especially survivors of color. Things need to change. Oswald's words are a call to action for all of us. And I know that with the support from the people on this stage with us today, and all of you in this room and watching today, that we can meet Oswald's challenge to ensure that all victims have their right to crime victim compensation and assistance met. It's an important example, really, of why we must never stop listening to the voices of survivors. And in keeping with that theme, I'm excited to announce that this week, the OVC Center for VOCA Administrators has introduced a new podcast series called Crime Survivors, The Power of the Personal Story. And this, yay, yeah. This podcast series features the voices of survivors telling us in their very own words about their experiences with the criminal justice system, with accessing services, all with the goal of helping us to improve our programs and practices. The inaugural po podcast features Juanita Bachelor, a survivor, advocate, and activist who shares her powerful personal story of how her life changed forever when her son was murdered. And like Oswald, she speaks of the heavy burden that survivors bear in the aftermath of crime. So before I turn to our speakers, I want to thank President Biden for his steadfast commitment for crime victims and survivors. In his remarks at the signing of the VOCA fix, President Biden thanked the angels working on the front lines to help victims, especially during the pandemic, 
that's made our work more difficult, more in demand, and more dangerous. Indeed, many of our honorees today, they maintained and expanded their services during the pandemic, some of them single-handedly, overcoming overwhelming funding challenges and barriers to outreach along the way. Our award recipients today include passionate advocates, service providers, health professionals, lawyers, and people with lived experience. They're working to care for survivors, expand our access to services, increase equity, ensure victims' rights, and promote healing and justice for all crime victims. Collectively, they represent the driving force of the victims' rights movement today, and I am so thankful to have all of you as my allies. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Amy Solomon of the Office of Justice Programs. When Attorney General Merrick Garland appointed Ms. Solomon to lead OJP in May of 21, it marked her return to a place that she loved. Ms. Solomon served for seven years in the Obama administration as the Director of Policy for OJP and as a Senior Advisor to the Assistant Attorney General. She now leads OJP overseeing about $5 billion annually in grants to support states, localities, tribes, juvenile justice activities, and victim service programs. She provides outstanding leadership for those of us at OJP, and I am so grateful for her and grateful to call her my boss. She is terrific. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Chris, for that very generous welcome. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I'm so pleased to be here to help welcome everyone to this year's National Crime Victim Service Award Ceremony. It is such a privilege to be joined by our department's leadership here. And as Chris said, their presence speaks volumes about this Justice Department's commitment to supporting crime victims and those who serve them. I'd like to congratulate all of our outstanding award recipients, the individuals, the teams, the organizations who have done extraordinary work on behalf of crime victims. It's truly an honor to recognize you for your achievements and contributions. Let me also be the first to thank Chris and her outstanding team for all the hard work that went into putting this event together and for the work they're doing each and every day to serve survivors of crime. And thanks, of course, to all of you for being part of today's event and for all that you are doing to support crime victims across the country. Today, you'll hear expressions of gratitude and support from the highest levels of the department. And I want to add my own pledge of support from the Office of Justice Programs. In addition to the leadership of Chris and the commitment of OBC, an even broader set of OJP resources are available to help better meet your needs. For example, our Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is investing in our nation's youth and improving the response to children who are abused and exploited with the goal of trying to prevent those crimes in the first place. Our Bureau of Justice Assistance is helping test sexual assault evidence kits and bring answers to survivors. They're also a key part of the administration's response to hate crimes. Our National Institute of Justice is leading efforts to find missing persons and solve cold cases. And they're pursuing critical research on issues from racial disparities to access to justice for survivors. And the Bureau of Justice Statistics is a key source of data about victimization, while our SMART office helps states and communities build the infrastructure needed to appropriately supervise those convicted of sex offenses and reduce the number of future victims altogether. And in line with this year's theme of rights, access, and equity, we are all leaning in heavily to the administration's work on racial justice and equity. And more than ever before, we're working to invest in historically underserved communities and communities of color. We know there can be no equal justice as long as large groups of our fellow Americans feel unsafe or are unable to obtain the services and the assistance that they need to heal. We stand committed to listening to and partnering with 
underserved communities to ensure that services are available, that they're culturally relevant, that they're accessible, and that they're trauma responsive. I am so proud of the work that the Office for Victims of Crime is doing to really lead in this way, and we are all trying to uh, provide justice for all victims. Our award recipients today embody the very best service to victims of crime. They've helped to make our world a more just place, a more compassionate place, and we are so proud to celebrate their amazing contributions. So let's move forward. It's my great honor to introduce our next speaker, an advocate for crime victims and a proven champion of the rights of every American. Please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland. Thank you, Amy, both for that very kind introduction and for your leadership of the Office of Justice Programs. And thanks, Chris. <laughs> for putting this all together and for everything your team has done. We would not be here today without the dedicated professionals of the Office for Victims of Crime and the Office of Justice Programs. You plan today's event and you do extraordinary work every day on behalf of the American people. So thank you to all of you. I'm happy to be joined today by Justice Department's leadership team, Deputy Attorney General and the Associate Attorney General of the United States. We are all here because we know that the nation's justice system could not function without victim services providers. Empowering and encouraging people who have been victimized to participate in our legal system is essential to justice. Demonstrating to the victims of crimes that we hear them and we see them and earning their trust in our work is essential to upholding the rule of law. The theme of this year's National Crime Victims' Rights Week is rights, access, and equity. That theme underscores the importance of helping crime survivors find justice by enforcing victims' rights, expanding access to services, and ensuring equity and inclusion for all. We are honored to be here to announce the recipients of this year's National Crime Victim Service Awards and to recognize the recipients of the awards for 2020 and 2021. These honorees, like the hundreds of other victim advocates and allied professionals here today, are true public servants. You are there for crime victims at every step of the way. You provide compassion and care in the immediate aftermath of a tragedy. You help victims navigate the maze of legal proceedings for months or years on end. And you support victims long after a case reaches a disposition and lawyers like us leave the courtroom. This year's honorees represent many aspects of the victim services field. The honorees include healthcare professionals who have dedicated themselves to providing the care, support, and compassion that victims of sexual violence deserve. One of the honorees personally and single-handedly continued in-person services, court accompaniments, and hotline calls to support domestic violence victims even when the pandemic began. Two of the honorees are themselves survivors of assault, abuse, and exploitation who turned their painful experiences into making a difference in the lives of other victims. Together, all of the honorees represent the best of who and what we all strive to be as public servants. At the Justice Department, we are putting our resources to work to support victim advocates fund victim assistance programs, and put victims at the center of our efforts to carry out the Justice Department's mission of upholding the rule of law. As expressed in the Justice Department's recent agency equity plan, we are taking department-wide steps that we hope will improve access to department services for underserved communities, 
particularly those disproportionately likely to be victims of crime. In 2021, our Office for Victims of Crime awarded more than $1 billion to fund victim services. Those include mental health counseling, legal assistance, and victim advocates, enabling over 11,000 victim assistance program to reach over 10 million survivors. This year, we will continue that work. The Office for Victims of Crime is releasing several new solicitations to expand access to services to those who have been historically underserved and underrepresented. And across the department, we are enhancing our capacity to prevent and prosecute human trafficking cases and protect and support human trafficking victims. The Justice Department worked hard to advance the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which finally occurred earlier this year. As it has since VAWA was first enacted, our Office on Violence Against Women is using every resource at its disposal to prevent and respond to gender-based violence, provide critical services for survivors, and support victim service providers. Our budget for the next fiscal year is seeking a total of $1 billion for the Office on Violence Against Women which is an increase of 74% over the enacted FY22 level. We know that survivors are more likely to seek services from organizations that are familiar with their culture, language, and background. That is why the Office on Violence Against Women is prioritizing and piloting programs for organizations that provide culturally specific and community-based support for survivors. We are also centering victims on our tribal justice work, in our tribal justice work. Native American communities have long endured disproportionate rates of violence. In October, the department launched a steering committee to address the crisis of missing or murdered indigenous people. The first priority for that steering committee is developing strategies for supporting victims and their loved ones. Whether we are addressing gun violence, combating fraud and exploitation, or supporting the survivors of sexual assault, victims and their rights are at the center of our efforts. This commitment to victims also requires an understanding of how far-reaching the effects of one criminal act can be. Hate crimes are an important example. We know that in addition to the targeted victim, hate crimes inflict terror and fear on entire communities. That is why the department is taking a holistic approach to confronting unlawful acts of hate by supporting not only direct victims, but entire communities. A broad and deep understanding of victims' rights is essential to our ability to carry out the department's mission and without the committed work of crime victim service providers, carrying that mission would be impossible. All of us in this work understand that the experience of crime victims is often so much more than a single incident or moment in time. To be a victim of crime can mean a life-altering and sometimes life-shattering experience that endures long after the crime is over. Last week marked the 27th anniversary of the, debate, of the day a domestic terrorist bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City, taking the lives of 168 people, including 19 children, and seriously injuring hundreds more. As the Justice Department's lead prosecutor on that case, I arrived at the scene 48 hours after the bombing. Broken glass, crumbled bricks were everywhere. 
the front of the building which had housed the children's center had collapsed and fallen into a crater. An army of first responders was sifting through the rubble for survivors and the dead. And everyone was crying. The prosecutors met with family members and survivors. We listened to their concerns. We held frequent briefings to keep everyone updated. We went to the memorial service together. We treated them as we would have wanted our own families to be treated. And that is really at the core of what you do. You treat people the way you would want someone you love to be treated if something terrible had happened to them. You do this when, strategy, when tragedy strikes an entire community, and you do this when tragedy strikes individuals. You help people and communities endure unimaginable loss and heal from unspeakable harm. You do this despite the exceptionally long days and the emergency calls in the middle of the night. You are nothing short of heroic. I am in awe of you. Thank you for being with us today. I'll now turn the program over to Deputy Attorney General Monaco. Mr. Attorney General, this department's commitment to victims of crime, to survivors, to families, starts from the top. And I think you saw a very personal reflection of what I am privileged to see every day. This department's commitment it has been charged to us in this space directly by the Attorney General. Um, and. I personally am privileged to carry out that work every day. It's an honor to join you, Mr. Attorney General, to join Vanita, Amy, Chris, and the outstanding team in the Office for Victims of, of Crime, as well as our partners in this work from across the country. Let me add my congratulations and appreciation to all the award recipients today. They have set a very high bar in their commitment and their service toward the goal of justice for countless crime victims and survivors of crime. In recognizing these extraordinary individuals and teams, we find truth in the claim, often attributed to Margaret Mead, that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can indeed change the world. You are the ones managing shelters, operating crisis centers, serving victims in homes and in hospitals, and helping victims raise their voices in the courtroom. You have kept your doors, both physical and virtual, open during a global pandemic when many victims were isolated and vulnerable. You've gone to extraordinary lengths to deliver vital services to survivors in every community. And you have accomplished the most essential of tasks. You have put victims at the center of every conversation about public safety and equal justice. You have all helped to change the world for victims whether a place of comfort, a source of strength, or a necessary resource, you have helped victims to stand up again and move forward as survivors. 
Unfortunately, crime and violence, though, continue to touch millions of lives, and the goal of just and fair treatment remains elusive for too many. Victims too often feel their rights are ignored, they find avenues of support inaccessible, and they sometimes discover that the services available in one community are missing in their own. The aspirations built into this year's theme, rights, access, equity for all victims, remains a promise, not a reality for far too many. But you, all of you here today, are working to fulfill that promise. And the department is proud to stand with you to ensure all victims can access justice. Our nation truly owes you a debt. The Biden administration is proud to support you in your critical work. Last summer, the president signed the VOCA fix into law, giving us giving us new tools to stabilize the Crime Victims Fund. Fines from deferred prosecutions and non-prosecution agreements now can be channeled into that fund rather than going into the general fund of the Treasury. And we are beginning to see the impact of that law. In March alone, this new collection stream brought in almost a quarter billion dollars. Now, I can't guarantee that we're going to see that level of collection every month. I'm hopeful, though, that the flexibility allowed by the VOCA fix will yield a more consistent source of support in the coming years for VOCA administrators, service providers, and ultimately, and most importantly, victims themselves. In the meantime, we continue to work hard to deliver critical resources to the field. Last year, our Office for Victims of Crime awarded more than $1.2 billion to states and territories to fund victim assistance and victim compensation programs. Another $40 million went to support sexual assault and elder abuse victims, survivors of human trafficking, LGBTQ plus victims, as well as those in historically marginalized and underserved communities. And OVC awarded more than $100 million to reach American Indian and Alaska Native victims through grant funding set aside specifically for tribal communities. We are very proud of these investments, but we know that the hard work of supporting victims falls most heavily on you, the ones on the front lines. You are the ones who translate these financial resources into services. You are the ones putting in the long hours, traveling the great distances, intervening in moments of danger, and standing by victims in their time of greatest need. You are the heroes. We thank you for all you do, and we commend you for your exceptional service. It is now my privilege to introduce our final speaker, a champion of victims' rights. Please join me in welcoming Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta. Thank you so much, Deputy Attorney General Monaco. I'm honored to be here with you today and always honored to be with the Attorney General uh, who brought us to tears in reminding us over and over again what we are talking about, which is transforming pain into healing and justice. Uh, I am really pleased to join all of you distinguished friends and colleagues from across the Justice Department, and most of all, to join today's honorees. We truly stand, each and every one of us on this stage, in awe. In awe of your many achievements, we are so proud to recognize you for the incredible difference you make every day in people's lives. And to do it, dealing with trauma and pain every day, to see what you see, to hear what you hear, to be out in communities that have too long been underserved or whose voices have not been recognized, let me just say for the Department of Justice, thank you. Thank you for what you do to hold people's pain and to bring healing to communities. I want to give special thanks to Amy Solomon and Chris Rose 
for their incredible leadership at the Office of Justice Programs and the Office for Victims of Crime. I get to work with them every day, and I, I'm always uh, so inspired by what they do. They are fortunate to work with teams of talented and committed people. Uh, thank you. Every April, we set aside one week to mark the progress that we have made in affording victims full access to the protections of our criminal justice system. National Crime Victims' Rights Week is a chance to recognize how far we've come. Victims today have greater legal protections than ever before. There are now thousands of victims' rights laws in place across the United States, including in two-thirds of state constitutions. Our Office of Victims of Crime is working hard in collaboration with victim assistance and compensation administrators across the country to expand the universe of services available to crime victims. OVC funding now supports thousands of local victim assistance programs and victim compensation programs in every state and territory and right here in DC. Victims in every corner of our country are getting help from skilled victim service professionals. But this week is also an opportunity to look to the future and the work that is still yet to be done. There are still far too many gaps in the availability of services. In particular, we have work to do on access and equity. The challenge of delivering services, quality services, to all victims in every community. We know that many victims don't get the help they need because they don't know that help exists. And most violent victimizations never even come to the attention of our authorities. Only about 40% of violent victimizations were reported to police in 2020. Support is especially hard to find in historically marginalized and underserved areas. For many people of color and for members of the LGBTQ plus community, conventional victim services may be less likely to meet their needs and in fact can sometimes operate as a barrier to healing. We can and should do better. One of President Biden's first actions in office was to call for a whole of government effort to advance equity and support for underserved communities across every sector of our society. That includes our justice system as a whole and its many parts, including victim services. And we have taken up the mantle at the Department of Justice. Last year, I had the privilege of joining Chris and her team as we announced the creation of the National Center for Culturally Responsive Victim Services. The center provides training and assistance to help victim service organizations expand their capacity to reach marginalized populations as a fundamental part of their mission. We are excited about this initiative. For far too long, communities of color have borne a disproportionate share of the burden of crime in our country. And this effort represents an important step in ensuring that all victims, regardless of background or status, can access the services they need and the justice they deserve. We are also extending our outreach to victims in the LGBTQ community, and there are more than likely other groups that suffer victimization and less likely to benefit from services that are responsive to their needs. And I'm pleased that we're stepping in to bridge this divide. OVC recently released a grant solicitation for updating a toolkit on responding to transgender victims with a focus on transgender women and girls of color who've been facing unprecedented uh, victimization by hate crimes, violence, discrimination, and erasure. A free and just society requires that all who are victimized by crime can have the support that they need to heal and access justice. I am proud to be part of this Justice Department and a group of advocates and professionals like all of you that work so hard every day to turn this aspiration into a reality. I urge all of us to join together as we work to help victims and survivors get on the path to healing and honor the dignity of that individual journey. I applaud each and every one of you. You are heroes for making this your mission. Thank you for all you do. Chris, I will now turn this back to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to our DOJ leadership. I am so honored to be able to uh, call myself a colleague of theirs. So now, let's turn our attention to the presentation of the 2022 National Crime Victims Service Awards.
This is Norbert. On October 19th, 1989, my 16-year-old son, Norbert, was going to play basketball. The young man who lived across the street shot him in the back of the head. I just made a promise to him as he was dying. For the rest of my life, I would dedicate it to trying to save the life of another human being. That was the beginning of mom, mothers of murdered sons. Our goal was to move people from adversity to advocacy. And the most important thing that we were hoping would be to get violence under the health umbrella. I've had my share of banging on desks down there before Congress, speaking engagements across the world. And that's what put me on that trajectory to this day of Atlanta Victim Assistance. Atlanta Victim Assistance has been around for 30 some years now. We serve all victims of crimes. LEAP is our law enforcement advocacy program. The city is made up of six zones, and we have advocates assigned to each one of those zones. We started LEAP because so many victims fall through the crack because their perpetrator has not been identified but the victim still needs services. Oftentimes, victims of crimes are intimidated by the court process. AVA is a critical link to conveying what's going on with the victim's perspective. We do programs in the schools, mediation, grief counseling. Sip and Tea is a homicide support group. They come to refresh their souls. I needed to be with people that went through what I went through. I've learned in these 30 years, we've got to turn our pain into participation. So as long as I have breath in my body, I will keep the commitment that I made to my son. I will never stop working on behalf of victims of crime, never. When people are in crisis, they're telling me very personal things that have happened to them and they've never met me before. We serve every domestic violence victim that comes to us. They are brave for asking for help. All of our services are free and confidential. People might not want to leave their abusive partner, but knowing that if something does happen, that you can go to your local neighborhood safe home and get the services that you're requesting. To me, it's really the heart of our domestic violence program. We're in a very rural area. We're always trying to find a way that our clients can get services they need. It's hard when you're working with children, preparing them to testify. It's scary. We started gradually just partnering with Keystone Pet Therapy for children that were testifying for child sexual assault cases. When they were asked very tough questions about what had happened to them, they would eventually answer us, but they would be talking to the dog. The open courtroom, it's a place that is very intimidating for those, even many adults that testify. A lot of times when we were preparing children to work with the Bikers Against Child Abuse, on the day of the actual trial where they have to face the defendant, there's usually a whole group. It was wonderful because it was men and women in their biker vest patches, emblems, right there with them when they have to be in the same room with somebody that's um, committed a crime against them. For me, active listening has been one of the hardest skills to learn because I feel uh, sometimes when people are telling me stories, I feel empathetic, I feel motivated to take action, and that's not always what people need. And so over my 20 plus years, that's what I've learned is to become a better active listener and hear them tell me what might help them. It's important to do, but I also do think that it is a calling.
in 87, during my early days of nursing, my preceptor walked up to me with this box and said, there's a rape victim down there and we need a sexual assault exam. And just read the instructions. We did not have any formal training for 10 years. We took the first SANE training that was offered in the state of North Carolina. It was a constant week of recognizing what I did not do. I would leave here every day on the way home. I'd actually cry. And that's when we started building this program. We started developing our own trainings and we were able to build our team. Several of the pediatric doctors started recognizing that there were nurses that had this skill set. Cases were being missed of child maltreatment. Um, there were situations where children died. So it was around 2003 or so, we started doing a more pediatric focused sexual assault nurse examiner training. Let's talk about child sexual abuse and what that means and what you're gonna be dealing with. Eventually I would go to the North Carolina Child Medical Evaluation Program. When I took over, I worked with pretty much all 100 counties. I would look at material and content. I would look at photographs. I would make recommendations for further evaluations. And a large part of what I did also was training. One of my jobs was to actually try to recruit medical providers in communities to do this work. About nine months before I decided I was gonna retire and announced it, they were developing two child advocacy centers within driving distance for me. So I thought, okay, I can retire and go down there and do it myself along with recommendations for well child check, dental visit, all the usual routine stuff. And that's not my only job. As the medical services provider for the Child Advocacy Centers in North Carolina, I'm doing the same thing I did at the CMEP program for the CACs. I think it depends on what the rest of the exam shows. I've always kind of been uh, a person that felt like I was 24-7. And I can't quite figure out when I'm going to really retire. If we don't help the victim who is a witness of a crime, then we can't hold people accountable. As a physician, I deem it my responsibility to be able to explain what is it that the victim says and what the victim doesn't say. Bringing the responsibility of health professionals to the forefront to identify and listen to victims of sexual violence. We can speak for the victim in a different way than a policeman or a district attorney. What I do for other health conditions, I can apply to sexual violence so that we can have more ways of giving credibility to the testimony of the victim. The Puerto Rico Health Justice Center is a safe place for victims of sexual violence all types of manifestations, no matter the age, no matter the sex, no matter what. The research that we do at the Puerto Rico Health Justice Center responds to needs. I don't do research just for research. I do it because there's something that we need to find out. If you don't have a multidisciplinary intervention that works together, you can end up doing more harm than good. We have all the forensic components, including the doctor, the psychologist, the social worker, and we even have a courtroom. Victim rights, we take them very seriously. Dr. Linda Lara started to collaborate with the judiciary and gave recommendations regarding how to best serve communities and, and that we should see the cases regarding sexual violence in one specialized court. Physicians that work with violence have to come out of the box. So we came up with the idea of doing mobile units so that when there is a situation, the emergency room is heavy, we can move the whole team and go where the victim is. We are with you and we fight for you. I'm really proud of them. Their struggle, their hope, I admire them. We're here for the victim.
It's hard to believe it's been 30 years. Yeah, no. Derek's basically spent his whole career behind the scenes. His work with Governor Miller and victims' compensation, I mean, that was huge. Victims' Bill of Rights was just coming on. It was our job to drive it. So we helped get it passed. You can take things that are on the federal level, make them work for your state. They appointed me director of victims' compensation. The impact of a crime so long-lasting, and that just became a driving force. Who processes claims faster than anybody? Insurance people. People thought we were crazy, but all of a sudden we started processing claims faster. Then I saw, oh my gosh, we're gonna run out of money. Hey guys, what are you doing with the extra fees from pardons and parole? Next thing I know, we're getting a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year added to the fund. In 1996, we were tasked with being victim assistants for the Olympic Committee. When the bomb went off, we were so ready. We worked through the night identifying victims, getting information out, finding families, getting compensation moving. They tell me I was there 86 hours before I went home. They could just go straight to jail. When I first was elected, Derek came to see me and he said, okay, here's what we need to do. I know you, you just got elected, so I'm gonna give you a year, and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna start Family Violence Task Force. I mean, exactly, full good. circle in a lot of ways. Yeah. We've just been awarded another federal grant for family violence, and we get to build on the things we had already started. Not, I'm not just talking about it. We're doing it. It's being creative, putting in the hours, and, and seeing around corners. That's how you affect change. The National Crime Victim Service Award goes to Brenda J. Muhammad. The National Crime Victim Service Award goes to Michelle L. Shea. The Allied Professional Award goes to Deborah Flowers. The Allied Professional Award goes to Dr. Linda Loris.
The Crime Victims Award goes to Derek Marchman. Barrier-Free Living started from a federally funded research and demonstration program to work with newly disabled people. And it was through that program that our domestic violence services evolved. The Secret Garden is a non-residential community-based program. We offer trauma-informed, client-centered counseling and psychotherapy as well as case management services. Mm -hmm. That uh, secret garden is there if I need the help. It's always going to be a shoulder for me to lean on. One of the things we realized early on was we needed to have an accessible shelter, and there were none. It took us 14 years of advocacy to finally get the funding to build this building. And so here we have Freedom House, the first totally accessible domestic violence shelter in the United States. There were very few people dealing with domestic violence and disability. The whole point of what we're doing here is to try to instill safety into the DNA of our families. There's a lot of emotional support in the group, also a lot of discussions around how to move on when they leave from Freedom House um, so they don't end up in a similar situation. Our supportive housing began because we found that about 20% of the people at Freedom House were going to need more robust This is what we do. We I, I hear it, I do. Like we try to get everything. It really gave me the motivation that I needed to like get back into school and I'm really grateful for that. We're breaking ground working with people with disabilities and the extra challenges of domestic violence, having access to what they needed to be able to be living safely within the community. Our hope is that people are leaving supportive housing to say, I got it. The Gender Health Program at Eskenazi is a multidisciplinary program that is designed to assist transgender and gender diverse patients. We see a lot of patients who have been assaulted or victimized in some way. The Victim Advocate Initiative was started in an effort to make sure that we were addressing a very important part of our patients' backgrounds. We quickly realized that we were not prepared to adequately take care of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. A third of the trans people that have sought medical care have actually had a negative experience. Our trans population is a great population to look at to really create better victim services and advocacy all around. Thank you so much. I'd love to hear more about what you have to offer and what you do. Our gender health advocates identify within the population and really connect to our patients. Due to my own personal experiences, I just felt like I wanted to be a voice and a vessel for folks. It allows patients first of all, to feel more comfortable disclosing what's happened to them. Having a victim advocate in our gender health program and also in the emergency room has been very helpful in allowing our patients to feel that they have support. The wraparound services that we provide allows them the opportunity to understand what their victim rights are. 
it really puts them in the driver's seat for their own care. We are in the passenger seat and we're letting them know these are your options. Just being that person who makes the experience a tiny bit better in a crisis situation while I'm also preparing paperwork for a protective order. If you can make your program or initiative effective for the populations with the most needs and the most complicated needs, it will automatically better serve everyone else. Not everyone understands that children who are abused and neglected are victims of crime, but they absolutely are. The first case I had as a CASA was very difficult, but it had a very happy ending. I was able to help my kids reclaim their childhood, and in the end, all four were adopted together. My children blossomed when they found a safe home I'm ready to go meet the kids and to be their advocate. Thank you. Linda embodies everything that we would hope for in a CASA. She, she's very dedicated and committed to the children. We spend so much time with them, getting to know their situation, their needs. Hello, guys, how is school? The importance of a CASA worker is being the voice for the children. And not only are they the voice for the children, but they are really the eyes and ears of the judge. Hey guys, I have somebody really special I'd like you to meet. Hello, what's your name? I'm Torin. Torin, I'm Miss Linda. I'm August. August, nice to meet you. Having that one person in their life who is stable, who is dedicated to them, who they can count on, makes all the difference to these children. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate, said Joan. That's a long name, isn't it? That's what I'm going to be for you. Your court if they can heal from their trauma, they are not going to pass that on to the next generation. Something that is important as a CASA volunteer is to share your experiences that you have had as a CASA with new volunteers who are just coming into the program. Your role is critical as it not only assists the court, but more importantly, provides a voice to children who are so vulnerable. I would encourage anyone who has ever even considered being a CASA volunteer to reach out to their local office and get more information because children need you. I am most proud as a CASA volunteer of the courage and resilience that the children show. They're the real heroes. When people ask me how I started doing research in the community service and violence prevention, it's almost a direct line from growing up in a violent household. School was a safe place, and I wanted to be somebody that provided that safe place. Seeing how the court system didn't work, you know, how the system failed, definitely did light the fire, you know, for me wanting to help personally as much as I could, but also to connect people to resources. I started with health communication and risk perception and a theory called optimistic bias, which in lay terms is bad things happen to other people. His work really provides us with insight into what these students are thinking. I think it's really important to get to children as early as possible. You know, where does violence come from? get students to recognize what the risks are. And actually having children understand what healthy relationships look like. How exciting was it to get that kind of information and realize that there was this window of opportunity where people were saying, you know, I need help potentially before I do create harm. We're taking data from the student body of Pittsburgh of these specific schools and using that data to improve the violence prevention curriculum. 
It's something that's normed to the students of this area. John's research directly empowers survivors in so many different ways, from everything prevention education, but also from legal, our legal services, to our rapid rehousing program. John's work with the Western Regional Training Initiative was revolutionary. So let's take a look at it. The purpose of the Western Regional Training Initiative was to share the resources and so to create a video library that allowed all of the centers to train constantly instead of just on a quarterly basis. The first year, that saved over $96,000 in training costs across the 13 centers in the 10 counties. Literally every program we have and all of the services that we provide are driven by John and what he does. Research helps provide access to victims of crime. Academia is the perfect tool for advocacy. The award for professional innovation in victim services goes to Barrier Free Living. The award for professional innovation in victim services goes to LGBTQ plus victim advocacy initiative at Eskenazi Health. The Volunteer for Victims Award goes to Linda Stambaugh. The Crime Victims Research Award goes to John Chapin. One in 10 students will experience campus sexual violence while enrolled in college. And the impact of that trauma can really change the trajectory of a student's life. We do have federal laws and guidelines around campus sexual violence, but at the state level, what we see is that the vast majority of states have no legislation addressing campus sexual violence. If we're going to break the cycle of sexual assault, we need to start by listening to the individuals and communities who are directly impacted by sexual violence, students. 
Our mission is to pass legislation on the state level that has been written by students in that state to address campus sexual violence and ultimately end it. What we are hoping to do for it is open doors for students so that they have options and choices when ultimately autonomy has been stripped from them. Anyone can go and write a bill, but it's not going to necessarily become a law unless you put a lot of advocacy behind it. Um, some of the things I want to talk about in my testimony are um, the campus climate survey and the amnesty policy. It is a movement to address campus sexual violence, and it is also a movement of ensuring that we are constantly looking to who is on the ground in campuses, what support do they need, and how can they advocate for their rights. Sometimes when I talk to students, they have a very slim understanding of their own research center. They know it exists, but they don't know if they're confidential. We've passed five student and survivor written, survivor-centered bills into law in five states. We know that our laws impact 1.6 million current college students. That's an incredible number, but we know that we will need to be working in those states for years to come to make sure our laws are implemented successfully. We are a movement of students, student survivors, recent alums, advocates, supporters. And so what we look towards is passing some version of our Every Voice Law in all 50 states. With every breath that we take, every sip of water that we drink, we all rely upon the environment. There's several statutes in place to protect the environment and to protect human beings. Uh, was pulled out of the tank. He was overcome by the fumes inside of the tank. Environmental crime is the knowing and intentional discharge or release of chemicals. An explosion or a significant massive event like that Often, there are actual individuals who have been directly impacted by these crimes. If environmental crime victims are not identified and notified and provided services, they're going to probably not even realize the harm that has accrued to them through an exposure. Back in 2016, we realized there was a need for a program. Environmental crimes, unlike violent crime or terrorism or cyber crime, is not a crime that most prosecutors prosecute. The purpose of the program is to make sure that environmental crime victims are afforded rights and restitution. We're bringing a more comprehensive approach to our cases and our prosecutions. The Environmental Crime Victims Assistance Program helps victims to find justice in a number of ways. Providing them resources, letting them understand what services are available to them. We're providing more information directly when we're going to sentencing. We created an emergency fund to provide direct assistance for crime victims. We've been able to successfully put up websites at both DOJ and EPA to help environmental crime victims. There's continuous training that's available. What we try to do with the program is to help the entire community one victim at a time. We've created a victim impact statement for environmental crime victims. We have drafted numerous versions of victim notification letters. There are survivors that without support from the Environmental Crime Victim Assistance Program might have felt helpless. Our work for environmental crime victims is not a nine to five job. It's a commitment that every member of the team has. Our victims were underserved. We were treading water in asset forfeiture and in financial litigation. So we looked to figure out what we needed to do to fix that. We were coming in on the back end of criminal cases. And at that point, it's really too late to get the money back for victims. Assets dissipate. 
they're sold, they're hidden, they're transferred. You have to be on the front end. So we started working with our criminal prosecutors early in the process. If there is a conviction, the assets are there to return to the victims. We took the asset forfeiture person, put them in the civil unit so they have more tools, and made them independent. We started with our weekly meetings. Um, let's go through and get our um, updates from everybody. We work with the Marshal Service, with probation, with federal law enforcement. And we had everybody there who could weigh in and say, no, that's not going to work, or yes, that's going to work. We've really improved our ability to get on garnishments. And then... When the victims' names were changing or victims were moving, it was there's a huge gap there. And we figured out how to fix that problem. We have every case on tops. We basically bug the heck out of everybody in the criminal division on every single case from beginning to end. We worked all together to uh, create this pamphlet. Oh, oh my gosh, this is so big. We had victims who were coming to the end of their judgment order. So we decided to put together the pamphlet that would explain what they needed and make it very simple for them. Now they're actively reaching out. A lot of times victims are aware of assets that we are not aware of. So they help us and in turn help them. And when we were just treading water, it, we probably collected about 100,000 or less for victims. This year, we are on track to collect $4 million. You can really do something great and help people. One night in 1988, I was sexually assaulted in my home, and it changed my life forever. I immediately called the police. They took me to the hospital for a rape kit for evidence. And while I was there, I had them to call my pastor. It was all about just really being there for as much as we can and providing help for. It wasn't until 2016 before I could sleep in our house without lights. I had called and asked a couple of times about the case and uh, never got any response or anything. My kit, I was told, was tested, but whatever my DNA was, it sat on the shelf for 30 years. Come to find out, this man has been in prison, and I'm thinking to myself, why did it take 30 years? I worked with survivors for system change and a couple of legislators to put toward a bill in order to get a DNA tracking system in Florida. They asked me, can we put your name on it? She's the first of many that will be able to bring some reconciliation and healing for other victims. And uh, I, I just think it's going to be a phenomenal tool that we can use and to be able to uh, you know, discover the perpetrators. People looking for their purpose. What I'm doing now is advocating and also so counseling. They As a pastoral the counselor, I determined that before I leave this earth, I'm going to do my part to, to get people to know that they do have help and what their rights are as victims. I'm seeking my justice and help some people get their own justice too. Justice to me is defined by the person who experienced that crime and giving them the opportunity to define what justice means to them is one of the most rewarding, rewarding opportunities in my work. I was born and raised in Honduras. At the age of 14, I was working at a restaurant. It was time for me to go home. These two men who I have seen before came out of nowhere. The last thing I can remember of that moment is feeling like a wet tissue over my mouth and nose, and I was gone. I was just thrown in the van, and for several weeks, days, I really don't remember when or how that even happened in the U.S. I was taken to a house for six long months. People came into that room to rape a child who had no means of protection. 
in 2004, police knocked down the door. I found refuge and education, going into college and understanding everything that would happen to me. I told myself there would be a waste if I didn't share my message with people impacted by trafficking. I am now a licensed behavioral psychologist. I work for the King County Department of Community and Human Services, and I oversee the mental illness and drug dependency unit. It makes me happy to have a full-time job, but also do those passion-driven things that I really love. One of the most exciting opportunities was being appointed by President Barack Obama to the U.S. Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. I also serve at the United Nations Human Rights Council as the Special Repertoire on Contemporary Forms of Sexual and Labor Exploitation of Children, especially boys. I also have had the unique opportunity to co-write SB 1320 that removed criminalizing in terms of trafficking. I don't know if I would consider myself courageous, but every time that I have been hurt, I felt broken. But there were so many more times that I felt at peace. I would have changed a few things about what has happened, but at the same time, I wouldn't change much. I am who I am. I'm married to the person that I love. I have a son. I have, I have everything. The Ronald Wilson Reagan Public Policy Award goes to the Every Voice Coalition. The Federal Service Award goes to Environmental Crime Victim Assistance Team. The Crime Victims Financial Restoration Award goes to the Asset Forfeiture Unit and Financial Litigation Program at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Tennessee. The Special Courage Award goes to Gail Francis Gardner. The Special Courage Award goes to Swamirs Pirino Guzman.
distinguished guests, your 2022 National Crime Victims Service Award recipients. Congratulations to all of you. Ah, oh, that's just beautiful. I'm so happy for each and every one of you. I want to take just a quick moment to acknowledge our award recipients from 2020 and 2021, many of whom are with us today. They're listed in our program, but they did not have the opportunity to have their ceremonies in person with us because of the pandemic. So we wanted to give them the opportunity to celebrate with us this year. So I'm delighted to be able to recognize them in person. So at this time, I'd like the 2020 and 2021 award recipients to stand as you are able and be recognized for your remarkable achievements. And that concludes this afternoon's ceremony. I hope that you leave today feeling inspired and hopeful. I know that I will. And I wanna take one last moment to recognize the OVC staff. I wanna thank Susan Freight, Emily Barnfiend, Yolanda Curtis Gibson for orchestrating this event, to J Street Productions for their production assistance, and to Robin Smith and all the producers and editors at Video Action. Please join us in the back for some light refreshments and to visit with all of your colleagues. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for being here. <laughs>